Hi, I'm Karen Osborne, and I'm here with Kate Kayan, a cellist on May 11th, which is the release date of my new novel, The Music Book. And we've just finished making a recording um, of, of, of some passages from the book, um, along with some passages from a sonata by George Crumb. And uh, we're going to just have a conversation about it, about the music and the book, and, um, and about playing music. So, um, Kate, it just seemed like this was such the, a perfect um, sonata um, piece of music that you chose after reading the book. And um, it fits so well with the passage that, um, from the novel. And, um, and, and it's also, it's a, it's a modern uh, music composer. So mm -hmm. um, I wondered if you could just tell us a little bit about that and how, what made you think of that music when you were reading the book? Absolutely. Um, so the composer is George Crumb. He's an American composer. He's still alive. Uh, and this sonata, his sonata for solo cello was written in 1955. So immediately knowing the setting of the novel in 1953, I was thinking of this sonata that was written around the same time. Um, uh, Crumb was on a Fulbright uh, fellowship in Berlin at the time when he wrote it. And it was an early piece of his, one of the first things he wrote. So he was kind of of that same generation, just, just finishing school, just out of school and trying to find his voice uh, as a composer, as a musician, at a time when there was this pulling between two kinds of music making. Um, uh, and and he talks about the sonata that he wrote, he dedicated it to his mother, and it's about feelings of nostalgia and homesickness. Um, and the second movement in particular, which is what I took the excerpts from is a theme and variations uh, that he's thinking back on his childhood and the summers that he spent running in the hills of, I think it was Pennsylvania that he, he grew up in. And um, just the idea of memories and looking back and also just the, the strong sense of emotion that the music, uh, each variation um, just pulls out of you when you hear it and when you play it. So yeah, for me, it was sort of an obvious it was almost, I, I wondered if you had heard the piece and knew it and was writing it about that. Oh, yeah, that is so neat. And I, I hadn't heard that, that particular piece before, um, but it fits so well. And um, it seems like that time period really called forth the need for a new kind of music. Um, I as I had, had mentioned to you before, I did do a, a, a lot of research, a lot of reading about that time period and um, coming right after World War II and the Holocaust, mm -hmm. suddenly in all the arts, nobody knew, um, how, knew, knew how to, you know, what a, what, a, what a poem should be anymore or what a piece of music should be or what a piece of art should be. And, um, in music in particular, I was just interested to find out that, you know, because so many of the composers had been German and there was suddenly this recognition that maybe all of this uh, attention to patterns and kind of more uh, rigid um, form and structure was not a good thing and that they had to find a way to break away from that. And maybe it was also just trying to find an expression for a new reality. I don't know, I feel like we're kind of in, maybe in that transition now. Yeah, exactly what I was thinking as well. Um, thinking of yourself in a new reality, post-World War II and post-coronavirus. Um, mm -hmm new voices, uh, wondering if the old way is what you should return to or if you should just figure out a new way of doing things. Uh, and yeah, that whole time period was just ripe with innovation and trying to look at things 
with new fresh eyes. And now some of those rebellious voices ended up kind of tempering themselves. They evened out a little bit. Uh, George Crumb's music, he, you know, he mixes meters. It's, it changes tempos and times and, and he does a lot of things that are kind of out there, even in this early sonata, but there are also gestures that are sort of, um, you know, Baroque Renaissance old gestures that feel familiar to the, to the listener. So, um, yeah, I think it was an interesting time of experimentation and finding your voice, um, you know, even with with Rini, the, the main character, trying to find her way and her voice as a female cellist in this, you know, when wasn't too long before her that that just was not allowed at all. Um, and she's trying to make her way in her new reality. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that was a lot of the other research that I ended up doing that I was, I knew that women had had a lot of difficulty um, in that time period, but I didn't know the extent of it till I started to do the research and the, um, the fact that uh, women were not even allowed to audition for most of the uh, performance opportunities, um, especially the ones with orchestras, but I guess with also a lot of the professional quartets mm -hmm. and um, and that they even when they were allowed starting in this in the 1970s when orchestras were told that they had to audition women and uh, minorities that they would often hang a, the curtain that they hung between that the 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 auditioning musician and then the um, and then the committee the hiring committee was often um, thin enough that they could see the, the woman's body and, or they'd ask her to ask the person to speak and they could hear her voice. Right, right. What's the point if <laughs> you're gonna do that? Um, yeah, you could also hear that they were wearing high heels as they walked across the stage. So eventually they started putting carpeting down to muffle the, the sounds of the different shoes. All sorts of things. I mean, my, one of my first cello teachers, uh, Nell Novak, was uh, one of the first females to play with the Boston Pops. And uh, she told stories of having to wear baggy clothes when she was pregnant with her first child because she was afraid she'd get kicked out for, you know, being pregnant and um, for drawing attention to herself. And to this day, um, female musicians, you know, we're told, or I guess all musicians are told not to wear nail polish. Um, <laughs> and I always just sort of assumed, well, it's because it's distracting on stage. I don't think that's true at all. I mean, they're looking at our hands anyway. It's not that distracting, but it was because in the times of my teacher, you know, she wouldn't sit there in the Boston Pops with nail polish. Right? She didn't want to draw attention to herself as a female. They just wanted her to fit in. And if she was causing too much of a stir and upsetting people, she'd be out. So I think that's where that came in. I'm going to start wearing nail polish. <laughs> you should. <laughs> Bright red. <laughs> it's like they want you to fit in and be one of the, one of the guys. <laughs> one of the guys, right. Yeah, exactly. Nowadays, we don't struggle with that anymore. I don't think there are female. I mean, I'm a cellist. So... I don't know if it's the same for brass players and percussion players, if they feel like it's difficult for them to get a job. I know tons of, of phenomenally talented female musicians who have great jobs in orchestras. Um, I think conductors are still finding their way. Um, I think composers have come a long way um, and some institutions are definitely helping by being more open to programming female musicians or not open to, but being aware that there needs to be more equality in their own programming. Um, uh, so progress still needs to be made, but it's, it's come a long way since 1953, that's for sure. Yeah, there were some pioneers back in 1953 who sure. really broke the ground and made it possible um, for women to, to play. Yeah. I mean, when I started reading so many of the obstacles that would have been there in the 1950s, one of the first 
things I really connected. It was the first time I started to really feel my way into the, this character of Irina. And as a writer, you really have to connect with something about the character. It has to really strike a chord. And, um, and the thing that really struck a chord was the thought that she would have had to have been a real fighter, I think. Yeah, absolutely. In that world. Probably your cello teacher was one of the first with the Boston Pops was as well. <laughs> She absolutely was a fighter, let me tell you. <laughs> if, you if you didn't show up to a lesson prepared, you saw that side of her. Um, no, but she was an incredible woman. Um, Irene was, you know, she reflects that, that type of person of that era who's talented and people want to give her opportunities. But yeah. at the same time, she still has to fight for every crumb once she's yeah. Um, and there's, you know, there's the, still the whole idea. I think women now feel like they have to be present for their children and for their household. And, you know, I, that isn't completely going away. But in 1953, there was a huge expectation that a woman would have children and settle down and take care of the kids and the household. Um, you know, in 1953, you didn't see too many husbands doing the vacuuming and the laundry. Uh, so I think that added a whole other layer to it. Like, do you want to have a career or do you want to have a family? Yeah, exactly. And it made pregnancy uh, uh, fraught with um, anxiety, I imagine, and, and decisions that have to be made. And, and, and that certainly does happen to Irina in the mm -hmm. novel where she has to make a decision about uh, having children or not having children and, um, and what that would mean for her uh, career and the stigma against um, somebody, as you were saying, who becomes pregnant. Right. And, uh, and then is not seen anymore as a professional. Right, do you lose your career? Can you take time off? Have you, can you come back? It's, um, there are a lot of decisions that women had to make and still have to make today. Um, and, and risks that they have to take. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I took several years off uh, of, um, of teaching um, because of my children and very hard to come back after that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Especially, you know, that, that's the reason that you would take time mm -hmm. off. It's not seen as a, legitimate, uh, as a legitimate reason. Right, well, it's a damned if you do, damned if you don't in a way. Um, and talking about being a fighter, that's what you're fighting against is they say, well, you can't do this job properly if you're, you know, if you have children and a household to take care of. And then if you go and take care of the children in the household for a while and come back and say, well, you left. <laughs> you know, so it really does take, you know, a strong personality to, to stay in that fight, to stay in the game and, and, and do what's important to you either way. Either yeah. way, it's important to be to determined and not yeah. be, not just give up. <laughs> right, right, exactly. Yeah. Well, um, you play with the um, Boston Modern Orchestra Project. So you play a lot of modern music, similar to the music that Irina struggles with. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and as you mentioned, George Crumb is one of those modern composers. And um, I wondered what that's like for a cellist. I know from hearing from my sister that, that some, of these, uh, some of this music is quite difficult. <laughs> it is. No, I could definitely relate to her struggles. Uh, yeah, and um, I mean, even back when I was at conservatory, at New England Conservatory, there's an amazing contemporary ensemble um, that I performed with when I was there and then when I was at the New World Symphony, we did a ton of premieres. So it was a lot of contemporary music there. And then um, back in Boston with BMOP, it's all contemporary music. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's really wonderful to hear new voices and it's exciting. And what I love about it is getting to know the composers that you're working with and hearing them talk about their music and their reasons for doing it. Um, and it can be quite challenging technically um, in terms of rhythm, in terms of the counting, in terms of the notes that you have to play, in terms of 
uh, what we call extended techniques where you're not necessarily just putting your finger down and drawing the bow across the string, but doing all sorts of odd things with your bow in your hands and um, you have to figure those out and harmonics and different different sounds. I remember when I was dating my now husband the first time he actually we were long distance and so we would visit but one of the first times he actually heard me play the cello was in a contemporary concert and I had to take a credit card and go up the strings with the credit card which made a very <laughs> slight sound and then I had to take my bow and draw it across the, the end pin or the spike the metal spike on the bottom of my cello at different <laughs> so he's not a musician and he was what what's happening <laughs> why, are <you> doing that? <laughs> why are you doing that his main question was you get paid to do that um but yeah I know it's 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 endlessly fascinating to to get to be part of the creation of new works and to yeah just some of them i don't particularly like some of them i love and when i choose the repertoire for my own concerts i always try to do some contemporary works um, but i really have to feel a connection to them there are some people who say, you know, I just think that this composer is really important and really great and has a great voice. And I don't particularly love this piece, but I think it should be played and I'm going to play it. I can't do that. I really have to love a piece in order to get out there and perform it over and over again. Mm -hmm. That's to strike a chord with you. Nikki. Exactly. No pun intended. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it sounds like, you know, the, the everything keeps changing in it like you were saying about the rhythm like if the timing keeps changing then you've got to be able to follow those shifts and it sounds like they're not predictable in 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 a modern music piece necessarily there isn't always a pattern i mean it's all written down um so you if you're following you can you can count it out uh, it takes a lot of mental math and it takes a lot of being able to change on a dime and it takes a lot of practice um, I mean, when, when people come to a, a Boston Modern Orchestra Project concert, yeah. yes, we've had four or five rehearsals, but the majority of the learning of the parts, the music happens in our own homes and our own practice sessions, you know, hours and hours of preparation goes into it before we even get together as a group. Um, so it, it does take a lot of work. It's different than playing a Beethoven symphony that we've all played many times. I mean, that takes a, a different kind of concentration and, um, and thinking about it musically, for sure. But um, yeah, I mean, Irene has a, there's a, a scene in your book, where she's in a rehearsal, and she's worried about the counting. And they say, you know, don't listen, just count. And it's true, sometimes you can't listen to what's going on, because it's not, it doesn't sound like what's going on and you have to just count. And then there are times when actually, if you just listen, you'll find that there is a groove, there's a pattern, um, and you can just, you can go with it that way. So mm -hmm. you're just constantly shifting gears, which is fun, exhausting, but fun. Yeah, yeah, I love that. I mean, I, I lo have loved those concerts um, with, the, um, with BIMA, the Boston Modern Orchestra Project. And I have to say that I had to learn how to listen to that music as well, uh, because it is so different from uh, traditional classical music. Mm -hmm. And, um, but that, that more and more as I learned to listen to it, I, I, I started to hear the, all of the um, range of emotions, which is, is in it. It's a, a much bigger range, I think, than, uh, than a lot of the traditional classical music. And maybe that's why it's able to kind of it, if it speak to us today. Um, oh, I think so. Yeah. I mean, I always tell people that they should listen to a piece of contemporary music at least twice. Yeah. Right. The second time they sort of know what to expect and just close your eyes and see what feelings and, and scenes it evokes in your mind. Yeah. See where it takes you. Yeah, then you can be tra actually transported by it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Does that happen when you're playing music as well? 
Like, I, I know that listening to music, you know, you really do have this experience that, um, that I tried to describe in the book that Irina has of meeting beauty. And when you're playing music, I imagine you're so focused on actually producing the music. I don't know if you simultaneously also have those um, experiences. Those kind oh, of, of course. Of course. Yeah, absolutely. Especially with, um, I mean, there are certain pieces of chamber music where you, you, you start playing a line and a passage that you love and you just can't believe how beautiful it is. And, um, you know, we all have those passages that we could just keep playing over and over and over again in our life and could never tire of them. Um, you know, like uh, one of the, the, the main themes of the Schubert cello quintet, for example, is just this incredible, if you guys and listeners, if you don't know that piece, go find it on YouTube and listen to it. It's, it's absolutely gorgeous. But yeah, I mean, every time you play it, you just, you're, you know, filled with, I don't know, love and fulfillment and, you know, your life choices <laughs> are confirmed in those moments. But you know, at the same time, you can get in trouble if you sort of wax too poetic or if you luxuriate too much in them. I remember I had a, was coaching a group of very talented high school students and they were playing the, the Brahms viola quintet. And one of my students had a big solo and it was gorgeous. And she played it, but every note got slower and slower and slower. And I asked her, I said, Lucy, why do you keep slowing down in your solo? And she looked up at me with these big eyes and she said, Miss Kate, it's just so pretty. I don't ever want it to end. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's true. But you have to you have to be focused on the on the phrasing and you have to you have to execute it as as a musician and enjoy it as a human at the same time. It seems like the experience of playing with other people would be so exciting too. I mean, that's one of the things that I, you know, that I, I realized when I was writing the book is that, you know, she, she, this is her first experience of playing with a professional quartet. And that's what part of the excitement is about uh, that suddenly you're, you're producing something between, you know, four different people and that you, you kind of, you can't really anticipate, you know what they're going to be playing, but you can't really anticipate how they're going to be playing it. Absolutely. Yeah. And the, the, um, the chemistry between the players and, um, I mean, first of all, you always feel a little bit vulnerable in those situations because you're pouring your heart and soul out and you hope it's like you're all playing the same piece, yeah. right? So if I'm playing a solo piece, it's just me, I can pour my heart and soul in and nobody can tell me to change anything. That's my piece. It's my interpretation. It's my performance. But with chamber music, everyone is putting themselves out there on offer but then it, you all have to agree. <laughs> so you have to be open to people saying, nope, not like that. Or yes, that was great. I like that, but change this. And it's, it's an interesting dynamic for sure. It's intense. It's vulnerable. It's very personal. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I can imagine that you do get close to people that you play with pretty quickly because you mm -hmm. have, you're sharing this intense, exciting thing that you're all passionate about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you all have that in common and you talk about it and you, you have the same language. So yeah, you, you grow very close to people that you play chamber music with and any music. I mean, it just kind of bonds you. Yeah. There's something similar uh, with um, when I go to the um, Enders Island where I teach with a, a group of writers and um, we're just on this island and all of us are writers, which sounds like you know, it could be a disaster, but, but right away, it's always wonderful. Um, you know, you feel like you're with your tribe. Exactly, exactly. It sounds like heaven to me. Yeah, yeah. You totally understand each other and you're, you're mm -hmm. passionate about all the same things. That's so a really exciting time. Well, I've enjoyed so much the opportunity to collaborate with you and um, 
and uh, the excitement of getting to hear the music along with the with the writing and um, and just the the collaboration of the arts. Yes, no, it's been so fun, and thank you for inviting me to come along on the ride. And uh, I really loved the novel. Um, could relate so well to all of the characters. I feel like I. I've known versions of them throughout my life. <laughs> and, you know, it's really such a such a treat to read it. You've known a few composers like Arthur. I've known a few, com yeah, et cetera, et cetera, yes. <laughs> yes, indeed. Uh, well, thank you very much. My pleasure, thank you. Thank you all for listening. <laughs>